Monster Tech is doing a giveaway on my channel. Stay tuned for details on how to enter. All right, let's see. I'm going to get some stuff for the Scorpius. What do we got? I actually want to try going Ballistic and Distro on the Scorpius. So let's throw let's throw those on. Let's get some better shields. And let's, out, let's swap out the Quantum Drive for something a little bit better. This Atlas is probably actually pretty good. Probably Are you going to change the coolers? No, they don't do anything. Let's talk about that. Star Citizen has ship customization, but the one component that has slipped through the cracks has been coolers <coughs> and power plants, but we'll get to that in another video. But there is another element recently added that I think coolers can help with, soft death. Currently, if your ship takes enough damage, you have a high likelihood of getting a soft death. The ship is permanently disabled and cannot be brought back online. Your ship can also be temporarily disabled, as is the case when you take substantial distortion damage. But I think coolers could be made to manage the likelihood of these two scenarios. Imagine that for each bit of damage you're taking, the overall heat of your ship is increasing. It gets higher, faster, depending on whether or not components are taking direct hits. The heat is dissipating according to the rate at which your coolers can do so. If the damage rate, and therefore heating rate, exceeds the cooling rate, then the overall coolant pool starts to decrease as the ship becomes more saturated. Think shield, but with heat. Once that pool is drained, the ship is overheated and therefore disabled. This isn't too different yet from how distortion damage works, but where distortion attacks your power systems and therefore shuts down your ship entirely, this overheated state will leave everything on, they just won't work as they're supposed to. Shield, weapon, and thruster recharge rate all get throttle limited in the same way your computer pulls back its performance when it gets too hot. Getting things back to normal means shutting select systems down to mitigate heat buildup and avoiding further damage to allow your coolers to catch up. So you're not dead in the water in the same way you'd be at the end of a distortion weapon, but you're going to need to be creative to keep going nonetheless. Furthermore, I think the pilot decisions should affect this as well. Currently, Power Management Combat Doctrine says that you should switch power to weapons when out of damage, and then switch all power to shields when going in for a damage pass. This gives you a 25% damage resistance through your shields when attacking, and takes advantage of a faster weapon recharge outside of your damage pass. So, when in an intense dogfight, you'll be switching power quite often. But it's feasible that switching the power flow like that is tougher on your power systems, like doing a hard reset on your computer. Sure, you can do it, and it'll survive most of the time, but you still feel wrong when you do it, and some part of you knows it's not the best. Therefore, what if every time you switch power like that, it takes a small dent out of your coolant pool? This gives more depth to power management and how it relates to your various subsystems. It also introduces ways to make the two primary characteristics of coolers more impactful. At the extremes, a cooler with a larger reservoir, but a slower cooling rate, will be less susceptible to overheating for a longer duration of time. But a cooler with a small reservoir and a greater cooling rate may not be great for long fights, but perfect for many small fights. Think a Carrick versus any fighter. For a large vessel, the bigger pool just might be better because how often are you charging into battle in a Carrick? But for the bounty hunter on patrol, that faster cooling rate plays directly into their profitability. Ships with two or more coolers can mix and match in a similar way to shields. You can get a benefit from mixing the extremes to get a best of both worlds experience. You'd be trading some coolant pool and some cooling rate for a better combination of both. Let's look at a couple scenarios. The horizontal axes represent different coolant pools. We have one for a big cooler and a much lower one for a fast cooler. As you can see, in this first case, they both reach their pool cap at the same time. The faster cooler rises in heat slower, but can't handle as much heat overall. So the maximum time for a single fight is very comparable between them. Depending on ship size though, the pool may be magnitudes larger in capacity-focused coolers than in rate-focused coolers. But we can also see that picking an optimized loadout 
can extend that single fight duration at the cost of repeat fight capability. Different coolers could be added to the game that reach their saturation points faster or slower depending on how pool size and cooling rate are adjusted. But I mentioned soft death before. This clearly has nothing to do with that, so how does it tie in? Well, we're moving away from ship go boom and more towards ship is disabled and no worky. This will be even more apparent by the way when armor is properly implemented, but the goal of a dogfight is transitioning towards victory through disabling a ship rather than making it blow up. So what if a temporary disabling is much more easily achieved than the soft death? You might get knocked offline by distortion or overheated with inadequate cooling, but assuming you take no further damage, you might be able to recover if you can dissipate the heat and power cycle your systems. But if you continue to take damage, then you're moving closer to that soft death damage threshold where you enter an unrecoverable state. Ships being sold in the verse with underpowered coolers are then much more likely to enter these temporarily disabled states. But by upgrading your cooler, you'll be able to take more damage before being disabled. This means that you can get closer to that soft death threshold before having the controls taken away. That gives a real advantage to upgraded coolers by making them more impactful to your overall combat effectiveness. But it also, again, introduces more trade-offs that need to be considered. For instance, a stealth loadout where avoiding detection is key may opt for less powerful coolers with exceptional efficiency to keep signatures low. You can put beefy coolers on a stealth ship, but now you're moving away from any stealth advantages. You'll be easily seen and an easy target. In that case, all your other stealth components might not take full advantage of your coolers and dogfights become harder as a result. A large ship that is not combat focused may choose to go for a very large coolant pool as we've already mentioned. This means it'll be really good for one fight, but might not survive repeated engagements. But since it's already a massive target, having a bigger signature is less of an impairment. So getting as beefy a cooler as possible might make more sense. But a fighter might need to make a compromise somewhere in the middle depending on their fighting style. So what would an ideally optimized cooler look like for a loadout? Well, it would be such that the time between an overheat and a soft death are minimized. So the rate at which you reach heat saturation and damage are roughly the same. Ships with inadequate cooling will be disabled much sooner than that and will pay the price. Ships with too much cooling won't take advantage and will be soft deathed before they can reach heat saturation. This would in theory be the better scenario of the two, but is also a waste of credits and might mean that depending on your fighting style, a better option might exist. In all cases, taking full advantage of your ship's capabilities will require balancing the different needs of a mission to tailor your loadout. It's very likely that the stock configuration will not be the best configuration based on your playstyle. Of course, as is already the case, firing your weapons will also affect your coolers. Those repeaters create quite a bit of heat under sustained fire. So min-maxing your loadout might mean selecting lower heat producing weapons. And of course your shields and power plant and thrusters all contribute under normal situations as well. The goal of everything we've discussed here is to make heat mean something. At the moment, coolers are so negligible in effect as to not even be worth switching out. But these changes would mean that you need to alter a ship's loadout depending on how likely combat is and how long the fight is expected to be. A loadout that's great for taking on a hammerhead might be terrible for taking on numerous fighters in Xenothreat. And this adds more flavor to the disabling mechanics being introduced and builds on ideas introduced previously. I think there's probably a lot more discussion to have in making heat relevant. What do you think about the ideas here? If you were in charge at CIG, how would you make coolers actually do something? With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are still doing a sponsored giveaway with Monster Tech. If you want a chance to win a set of chair or desk mounts, all you have to do is like and subscribe to my channel and comment on any of my videos during the giveaway period with that video's corresponding secret word. Today, we talked a lot about coolers. What is the other component that gets ignored when making a loadout? Comment on this video with that word and I'll know you are paying attention. If you want to get 5% off your order at Monster Tech, 
All you have to do is use code oddjob at checkout and they'll take care of you. As for myself, I'm really happy with my Monster Tech products. They're solidly built, very robust, and the ability to contact a company and have a custom order made and be treated quickly and fairly, I think is great. So Monster Tech is doing great things for the flight sim enthusiast, and I think you'll be happy with any products you get from them. I know I certainly am. Other than that, like, share, comment, subscribe, do all the YouTube things, and let me know what you think. And until next time, this is Odd Job Entertainment, signing off.